Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Ramos Law Difference Makers podcast. I'm Dr. Jim Hoven, your host, and it's my pleasure to meet with people making a difference. And today, no different than that, we are having a rock star, well, kind of literally almost a rock star <laughs> in our midst. We are going to have the great, and I say great because he's a great friend. Also, he's great to work with as a partner. And as it turns out, he's a great singer. So a pseudo rock star, because, you know. Sure, on a I'd small get, scale. On a small scale, pseudo <laughs> rock star and great friend, Johnny Maroney. Johnny, welcome to the show thank today. Thank you so much. It is an honor to be here with you. So thank you for the invite. We, we've talked about what you do. And again, for those people who have never met you and don't know what this is about, we're going to talk about music today. Sure. We're going to talk about singing and we're going to talk about how that changes lives because on the Difference Makers podcast, obviously, this is about what makes a difference. Sure. And what you do it really makes a difference. I get the chance to work with you every day, right? Because you are part of our, our social media or our digital team, making sure our website is working good and everything's connected and the message about Ramos Law gets out. But outside of that, you have this thing that you want to share with the world and it's the gift of music, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really unique. I mean, I guess I'll give you the quick backstory to it is that um, I, I grew up playing hockey. I was very plugged in with, with athletics. I thought that was going to be the course of my life. I went to, you know, training camps and all that. I was like, this is my path. And were you a good hockey player? I was, it was, yeah, I was a small guy. I was speedy though. I, yes. had, I had speed on my side. And yeah, I, I found a lot of success in there. I went to, um, um, like I said, different training camps for potential Olympic stuff. Like it was, you know, it was my path and it was all I did. Eat, sleep, breathe hockey. And then one day my mom and dad came to me and said, hey, you know, grandma and grandpa, they go to this acapella show and they really want to bring one of you grandkids. Will you go? I was like, all right, I'll go. As a hockey player, were you excited about that? No, I didn't (laughs) want to go to this at all. It sounded terrible. And I went... I went to this Christmas performance and the curtain opened and there was this a cappella male men's chorus of 130 voices singing four part harmony, like a barbershop quartet, just on a massive scale. And my jaw hit the floor. And how old were you? I was 15, 16 years old. And I just, I could not get enough of it. It was like a drug to me. I fell in love with just music and a cappella music in general. And it completely reshaped my life and trajectory. I'm sitting at this table, which maybe I can bring full circle as to how my life has been impacted through this musical genre. And uh, now have my, my met my wife through this organization. Now I have four kids. Uh, I had my career path all because of the influence of this acapella community. So you can imagine wow. being, you can imagine being a 16 year old young man carving his way in the world, going back to his hockey team saying, I'm, I'm going to quit hockey. I'm going to sing acapella music. So, okay. So wait a minute. Uh, you're, you're literally now, do you know, first of all, do you know you can sing? Uh, no, I was, no, I, you know, I kind of dabbled in a church choir, sang in the high school choir, but I was never, never claimed to be a singer by any means. And, but it was the music and uh, the showmanship and everything that sold you that literally in that moment you said, I got to try this. It was one of those things, which I think, I think everybody's experienced. I think where if you, if you've seen an acapella group or even just been to an, an orchestral performance or something where you get goosebumps on your arms, you know, just cause just from a musical moment where, you know, you're, you're the hair on your arms stands up. That's what it did, did for me. These guys, 130 male voices singing. And it was just like, whoa, and had a tremendous impact on my life. So, uh, like I said, I abandoned all athletics. And did com- you get grief for that from anybody? Oh, gosh, can you imagine? 16-year-old boys? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I took some lumps for sure. But looking back on it now, it was, without a doubt, one of the greatest pivots in my life. You talk about you know key moments in life that, that, that shape who you are. And I look back on it now, and I'm so glad. I guess I was willing to make that leap. So um, That is insane. So you, you decide to do this. You know that you enjoy singing because you've sang a little bit. You didn't know what level you could be or where you could take it. Obviously, you're 16. At 16, interestingly enough, you know, you see that episode, old episode of the Brady Bunch for anybody that are old enough to remember that. And they have a little singing group and one of the guy's voices is changing in one of the episodes and they go through this singing thing and he has to talk about that. At 16, you join this group. Was your voice solid in where it was or did it, were you in that process of where it was changing? Still transitioning. Yeah, for sure. Cause you know, the, the, the voice and the vocal mechanism is always evolving. And though they say the voice doesn't really even settle until you're kind of 30 is in your mid thirties. I did not know that. Yeah. So it's always evolving. So when I joined the acapella ensemble, I started singing tenor. 
of all things, right? So, okay, so and, explain the four parts because okay. I know of I know of them, but I don't know what sure. they are. I'll give you a little. So, like I said, this genre is like barbershop, and when people think barbershop, they're thinking straw hat, pinstripe, and it is not really like that. It does keep the same sort of musical principles of four part harmony, where you have the bass in the lowest voice part, then a baritone, and then you have what is called the lead singer who sings the melody of whatever song you're singing, and then the tenor on top of that. So it's four part. And so I came in singing tenor, the highest part. And over the years, though, I slowly moved to lead and then slowly nestled into baritone, which is what I sing now. Oh, wow. So, and uh, that wasn't intentional. That's just where your voice just, evolved yeah, to. Yeah, I just found that I was more comfortable there and... Um, the, the way that barbershop harmony is structured, it, it felt like home. So singing baritone is where I finally landed. So so to, to bring it back to kind of how I got into this, so I joined at 16, I was a member of the chorus for maybe eight years, and then they started moving me into a leadership role of being like a section leader where I was in charge of the baritone section uh, and eventually found my way into uh, becoming a co-director of the ensemble now. So Wow, yes. And so I want to talk about that because there's two big groups that that you're a part of one mm -hmm. is the big the big 130 correct um, voice group yep. and would that be considered an ensemble or is that a, a chorus it's great it's a great question yes it, would, it can be classified as all the above an ensemble a chorus or a choir you know and okay. it just really depends on who you're talking to it's the difference between lawyer or you know uh attorney attorney exactly you know it's just kind of a semantic so um so yes i was part of that group and that's the ambassador of ambassadors of harmony that is exactly right so that group is called the ambassadors of harmony 130 ish voices were based out of the suburb of st louis and from there though i met some of my dear buddies and we started a barbershop quartet right out of that group you pulled three other guys out and more then you or guys less it's a yes that's ultimately what what transpired is that I sang in the uh, barbershop quartet in high school, right, and then did it in college as I was singing within the ambassadors throughout that that term, and through there met connections, and we ended up bringing a buddy that ended up coming to university with us from Pennsylvania, and we started a barbershop quartet. So the four of us are a quartet, but we're also all four singing in the ambassadors as well, and because. I guess of the good fortune of having the ambassadors as a supportive role and mentoring and guiding and providing music and coaching, we found success as a quartet extremely fast by all things considered. And were they watching you and mentoring you and kind of, were they like, yeah, guys, go get it. You're taking four parts in four people versus four parts of 130. Exactly. Now you're taking this to the college level. Exactly right. So we are now a barbershop quartet. We're receiving coaching and arrangements and all that from uh, resources within the ambassadors. So they're helping support. And so we got the opportunity and an invitation to compete at the International Collegiate Barbershop Quartet Contest, where quartets literally from around the globe come and compete with the chance to win. And I think it was uh, maybe a thousand dollar prize or three thousand dollars. And we're like, oh my gosh, like, let's do this. Yeah. So back to the ambassadors, they helped support us financially to get there. We were just bummed out college kids. You and know. what year was this? This would have been 2004. Okay. Right. So 2004. And so we went and we're, we were on stage and we are actually, we were behind stage getting ready to go on stage and a quartet from New Zealand, these very robust, just ginormous Aussies, real dark skin, just barrel chested up there and they're singing just like monsters. They just sound so old and so mature. And we're like, oh my gosh, we are way out <laughs> of our and league. And we're next. <laughs> yeah, here we are, little, little Midwest boys come in. So, um, but I say, you know, at the end of it, when the dust settled, we actually ended up winning that contest with the highest score ever recorded at the collegiate level. And that is what really, I say, was the springboard into the, the, the real pivot in my life. So I was obviously singing a cappella music, but it was with this quartet and that single contest where we just walked out there, we sang two songs, you're judged by 15 judges and the highest score wins. And we won that and that is where my life forever changed. Well, in that do they, do, I gotta know, do they judge on just the sound of the song is there a for lack of a better term an action part or how you move or sure. what are the fundamentals that create the scoring system great question so there are three categories we're judged by there's singing there's music and there's presentation so the singing is how well you vocally produce 
so we use a term in our, our industry, if you will, called ringing chords. How well do the voices align to ring or lock a chord? And if you've so ever how, heard it, you I, I never heard that term, and I know exactly what you're yeah, talking about. After it, listening to it, I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I know what that yeah, is. Yeah, you can tell when it's right or when it's wrong. Yes. So they're listening for that. The music part, the music category is how musical are you making it? You know, is it if it's a rhythm song, are you accurate to the rhythm? If it's a, it's a, if it's a beautiful ballad, are you finessing the words correctly? What are the breaths like so they're looking at the musical shape and nuance and then the final one is presentation so they look at it more holistically across mm-hmm. the board how is this you know as an audience member what's going well are there inconsistencies between the visual plan and the musical plan so so the three categories again are singing which is just how well you're producing the musical is how uh, I say the musical nuance. Are you uh, addressing the arrangement of the music appropriately? And the final one is presentation. So we are judged on all three of those. They call off the winner. They call off second place, and our name wasn't now announced. So we we kind of figured that we maybe got the gold. And medal. how many teams? Oh, there was people. I mean, there was probably maybe twenty five or thirty at that contest, but. Globally, you have to qualify to sure. go. Yeah, you so have to make hundreds, it through the ranks. There were hundreds of quartets around the world, and they basically bring the top 25 and maybe 27 quartets in. And so we ended up winning, and which was a, a great, just, you know, I say feather in the cap. Just like, oh, my gosh, man, we can really do this. And that was when things changed, because the moment we got home, we had invitations to go to England, uh, New Zealand. We've been to China, Russia, Sweden. I mean, we've been to probably 20-some-odd countries. Do you uh, guys still practice together? Because that's been 15 years. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Well, the, the, I'll take the story a little bit further, and then, yeah. which, which may help bring color to that. So we won the college contest in 2004, and we thought we were pretty hot stuff. And so then we went to go compete in the men's contest the next year, right? So no more college stuff. This is like the best of the best on a global level yep. at the international contest. And to provide color to everybody, you know, in our little organization, which is maybe 40, 50,000 members worldwide, it's not that big. But within this community, this is a big deal. Like yes. the, the international contest, the men's contest is the great. Super Bowl. It, it's the Super Bowl. It's a- absolutely correct. So we come off of winning this college contest. We're like, man, we're just going to go win next year, right? We can go win. And it was in Salt Lake City, Utah in 2005, right? So the next year, we're practicing every day. Same songs or did you change it up? New songs. So now instead of singing two songs like we did at the college contest, you now sing a total of six songs over three rounds. So there's roughly 50, 60 quartets the first night. Then they trim that down to 20 quartets. And then they trim it down to the top 10 by elimination. So we make it there and we get, uh, we, we're, we qualify, right? We get to the qualification, we're heading there. And the day before, the base of our quartet calls us, hey guys, I got laryngitis. Oh, True story. No. True story. So he got an injection, has taken meds, and it's in Salt Lake City and it's dry and it's all, you know, all these variables. And we end up getting sixth place that year. So we just missed the medals. They issued medals to the top five. And so we missed it. And we're just like, man, you know, we're just devastated. And, and the other young whippersnapper quartet that was coming up, they beat us that year. And man, that, that stung. And But the truth is, you know, we talk about just the life lessons. As I say, I get older and look back on this. It was like the best thing ever. Because I think if we would have gone in and won or made a bigger splash, I don't think we would have been or turned out to be the quartet that I think we are today. Mm. And because I think by getting that sixth place, not winning a medal, I think it was very humbling because we come off this banner year, traveling the world, signing the autographs, the CDs, and then we miss the mark. And and that was through that that I think the quartet. And I, I look at I look back at all these experiences now through a, a different life lens, if that makes sense. And I'm really glad that that took place because from there I think our work ethic doubled, you know, and we were more focused and ready to go. And so that we went in in 2006, the very next year, and won the international contest. Oh wow! So you so, guys won at the collegiate, then you won the international. Yes, just two years later, which is really I say rare. And and uh, and what 
what was really unique too, to kind of circle back, which I maybe kind of alluded to, I can't remember if I told you the story. One thing that I think why our little quartet found success early on is that when we were at the university, the president of the university paraded us around like like a dog. You know, we, he wanted us to sing at every ribbon cutting ceremony. We sang every national anthem. We were on every TV interview. We sang at every ribbon cutting, you know, uh, donation thing. So he paraded us around and he liked the quartet so much that he gave us our own standalone house, right? Right next to the music. You know, we weren't stuck in a dorm or anything like we got our own 2000 square foot standalone two story house. And we just practice all day, every day. And so that's why I think we found a little bit of success early on is, you know, we practice every day. We went to this college contest, practice every day, you know, got sixth place, practice every You're day. You're prepping and for something 100%, all the time. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk about the prep for that. When you guys, so your college students, are you guys all music majors is everybody coming out of a different thing and then you're practicing music together was the music an outreach or just an extension of your everyday life at that time so the other three are all music majors i have a minor in music i started out in uh getting a major in music wanted to be an elementary school music teacher and just felt i was being led to to do more business type stuff it's kind of you know the the way that i think my brain is wired is more business so i ended up so i have a minor in music and, and ended up getting a degree in marketing and sales but the rest of the three are all music and they actually make their profession now uh in music so wow yeah, so they're, they're that's what they do well, you know it, it's fascinating <laughs> i've watched videos of you guys as the quartet and as the harmonic group right mm -hmm. so I, I was watching videos and i was amazed by a couple things one is when you think of singers and you know you're not used to seeing so many people doing so many things all at one time if you're seeing a band and if you're seeing that like everyone's got their part but they're not all doing the same thing at the same time yeah. you know what i mean like you got the the people singing harmonies in a rock band and some are playing this and doing that sure watching the group of 130 of you guys doing a coordinated effort where everyone's kind of moving and swaying and they're you're singing the same thing i'll i'll be under these four different parts it's a show yeah. It, there's so much showmanship and energy. It's not like a choir that you typically would think of where everyone's singing a song. This is an event. Yeah. It's an experience. Yeah. Which is, is that accurate to say as you guys prep for that? How do you bring in that side of being able to sing while being so active? Because the voices are big, but... It's like running wind sprints across the stage. Yeah, it's uh, so for those of you who don't have context, and I know we're on a podcast, but take 130 guys and put them on risers. So there's a bunch of guys up there, but there's also choreography involved in all of this. So there's moving and jumping, and there's a front row that will come out and do you know acrobatic you know moves, and and all this is going on while maintaining singing four part harmony, perfectly synced for minutes you know, on for minutes, minutes on minutes at a time. And and I, you know I think it really I think you know to to kind of get into the weeds of how I associate, you know, um, the musical aspect of what we do to life and just to excellence is that, you know, like the ambassadors of harmony, when we are prepping to go compete in the same contest, there's a quartet con, there's a contest for quartets, right? That our quartet called vocal spectrum. That's what we won. But there's also the, at the same event, the chorus contest. And it is a big deal, you know, cause it's, it's, it's again, it's the Super Bowl for choruses in our organization. And in preparation for that, we will spend, I mean, you know, as we're getting ready, we will spend 45 minutes of time on two bars, you know, which is maybe eight seconds worth of music. And we'll spend a half hour, 45 minutes squeezing out every ounce of musical detail from the vowel, the target vowel, you know, if it's an ooh or an ooh, and that times 130 is a dramatic difference. And so there's, there's, you know, I know people joke and say, you know, there's harmony and musical harmony, but it really is. It is. There's a direct correlation between the harmony amongst the members and the and the community that is generated through this musical excellence or the pursuit of this musical excellence. Because we, everybody that stands on those risers, is committed wholeheartedly to those seven words at this moment, and we've got to be pristine. And if one guy is doing the vowel wrong or he cuts off the word too early, it completely disrupts the ecosystem. Wow. And you're so, the co-director. And so correct. watching you, and again, watching some videos and going through the process, kind of pre prepping for our conversation, it's interesting because as watching you direct this, it's similar to an orchestral director where they're doing their thing with the musicians, right? Sure. Or with the, the people playing instruments. 
but then you're turning around, you're part of the show, you're singing, you're moving within that. So you're in and out of the front of the stage. Yes. When you're looking from that perspective at all these, these guys, you guys are all training together. How do you stay connected to the four parts? Are they really dialed into you or what's the purpose of the co-director similar in the same question it would be for a, an orchestra? For symphony? Yeah, sure. So my job is to, as far as a director goes, standing out front and is responsible for ultimately keeping the ensemble together, right? From a tempo perspective, from a musical development perspective. But if we're doing an uptune, let's say a high, you know, snappy, it's fast, we're dancing around, you know, that's when I have to put a lot of trust and faith into the chorus where I pass, you know, I say the, 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 the more, more, uh, the, what, the, the baton, the baton. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah, like the metaphor of handing them the baton where maybe I need to excuse myself from being in front of the chorus to go do a move over here. We got to highlight something over here. And that's when, you know, the, the, the faith and trust comes in that they are going to keep the rhythm right where it needs to be. And adrenaline doesn't take hold of them while we're on the contest stage. And all. So it is a lot of in and out and it's a lot of faith, a lot of trust and ultimately a lot of practice for, 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 for we always, we have a, a saying that we say that, that hard work is fun when improvement is evident. And so that's kind of the philosophy we use going into our rehearsals is that, you know what, this hard work, you know, spending this 40 minutes on these two bars is fun because look at the improvement. You know, yes. So hard work is fun when improvement is evident. Well, who does the, how do you choose music to do? Or is there a standard list of songs or do you guys take songs that people don't think of and you turn them into this type of music? And, and if, when people, if you don't know what I'm talking about, we're gonna give, I want you to give ways for people to go watch these things sure. throughout the show here. Because if you don't know, if you've never seen it, if you've never experienced it, it's insanely cool. But I, I was so fascinated by the difference between the group and the quartet. Sure. So in the quartet, you guys did a certain, there's movement, but it's almost like it's coming inspired movement from inside of each individual within there, as opposed to the really choreographed yeah. effort that I saw amongst the, the big group. Who choreographs that, that? How do you pick a song and how do you make, how do you tell the story through movement? That's great. That's a great question. So the music that we come up with, it, it, there's no right or wrong. I mean, like it's it's really kind of whatever the, the arranger. So we're very fortunate that we have the actual arranger, the ones that so the music that you listen to is actually arranged in house by one of our guys. He's brilliant. He's the head of mathematics at Wash U. Uh, he just recently retired, so he's a mathematical genius, which I think lends itself really well to to the musical aspect of just rhythm, musical shape, um, all of that. So we'll, we will come up with a with a piece of music that we like, and we run it by him. And say like you know, hey. I'll make this one up, the old uh, song, Top of the World, which I th maybe yes. I sent you that video, Top of the World, yeah. looking down on creation. So we sent that to him and like, David, do you think you can make this work? And he'll, you know, he'll, he'll chew on it. And yeah, I think I can make this work. I've got some ideas. So he will then create the arrangement again. So we've taken that song and now he's condensed it into four part harmony and it lasts, you know, two, two and a half minutes. And so now we've got this arrangement and now we need to layer on choreography so that we're not just standing and singing, but we're, you know, we're, we're, we're creating a musical moment that will hopefully that the choreography will complement the music so that an audience member will go, wow, that was extremely satisfying on all levels, musically, visually, just wow, what a show. Um, so from the choreography perspective, actually my brother and I are the ones that do the choreography oh, for the no course. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. yeah, so we we do that and we come up with all of it and we teach the front row and it's it's arduous. It's not just like a little t tap dance or anything. I mean, it is very intense, um, lots of sweating, but it's it makes for a great show when you glue all these pieces together. So, How many numbers can you guys do that you can prepare for like how, how big of a show could you guys put on? And maybe it mixes. Maybe you do a lot of these theatrical performances mm -hmm. and then you do standard stuff where you're singing, you're standing sure. and singing. How, do, how does that work? Because I can only imagine how long it takes, like you said, 45 minutes for eight bars. Yeah. And then you put movement into it there's not enough time to practice to do 20 of those things for a concert, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll answer that question, but just to provide a little bit of context as well. So the Ambassadors of Harmony rehearse three and a half hours every week. Every Thursday night, it's three and a half hours, and it is a completely voluntary organization. So these are just normal guys, 
off the street. Some of them are doctors, some of them are lawyers, some of them are students, some of them are mechanics. I mean, they come from all walks of life. And the thing that I think I love most, and especially as I, I say I age and I realize and recognize that all of these guys come together and it makes zero difference of what your status, gender, economics, all it does not matter at all. Job, it, we all get there. And when you get there, you're just an ambassador of harmony, you know, a member there to make great music alongside these other guys, like-minded guys. Um, so when you say how, how you know, from a repertoire standpoint, everybody's extremely committed. It's mm-hmm. like almost like a cult, you know, where you, know, <laughs> you, you get into this and you just fall in love with it. And, and the statement that we have too is, you know, you, you come for the music, but you stay for the friendships that you generate. And that is absolutely true. I mean, my, my weddings, you know, all they're all guys in my wedding. They're all my best friends from the musical organization. And so they're very committed to learning the music. So we, we don't learn, we don't learn music on the risers. We send out the assignment and say, Hey guys, we're going to work on these measures. We have audio tracks that help provide them their voice part in, in the speakers so they can learn their part quickly. And so, that is the expectation that has been set. So if you're going to be an ambassador of harmony, that assignment goes out, here's the sheet music, here's the learning track, and you're expected, the expectation is to come back ready. So when you say, how much song, how many songs can you do? You know, we could probably sing 25 songs right now. You wow. know, for, for, an, for a course that size, you know, it's, it's a lot to keep up. It's a lot to keep right. up. Right. And how many of those will have the actual, actual theatrical component to them? All of them? I, some I would, of them? I'd probably send somewhere in the 25% range. Those, okay. those take a tremendous amount of upkeep. Tremendous. It is, yeah. If you see one of the videos, it, you'll, you'll quickly see. And if you want to see one of those, maybe I'll throw out one of those plugs. If you just go to YouTube, right, and you just type in Ambassadors of Harmony, just Ambassadors of Harmony, you'll see just a plethora of videos. Um, one of them on there's got a couple million views, which is probably one I maybe I steer towards. It's called 76 Trombones, uh, and uh, it's it's very theatrical and it's got some pretty cool uh, highlights in that one. So, um, so anyway, yeah, it's it's it is pretty remarkable to think that it is a, just a bunch of voluntary guys that get together and sing, but they don't sing; they make great music. That, oh no, you guys yeah. literally watching it, it made me smile, and yeah. I was watching it through like you said a computer screen, watching it through YouTube. And it made me so because the joy that you were having the and the energy and the passion and, and then with watching you in the quartet, the strict quartet, do you notice that you find a different sense of purpose, meaning joy when you're singing in a smaller group than the larger group? And now you have a different role, right? In the larger sure. group, you're directing, you're the co-director sure. of that, but watching the intensity of what you guys were doing, and I could see fun, make no question. Um, the lead singer, I think, as you called it, the in a couple of the videos that I watch, man, it's it's interesting because his mouth just opens oh, yeah. <laughs> so wide and a big voice comes out that can be so dynamic, but it's intense. There's an intensity to it. Do you feel that when you're singing? Yeah. I mean, the quartet is certainly a different experience, you know, from directing and standing in front of 130 guys to now just being one of four is a significantly different feel and the responsibility I would say is you know you could maybe hide a little bit up in the chorus but with just four voices in front of an audience I mean that's it you know and it is a different level of responsibility um, not that it dismissed the chorus part, part of that but the quartet is different in that it the, the, the musical nuance that we work on is very granular. You know what I mean? When we were going into contests, we'd spend hours and hours and hours, you know, just working on that as well. And so I think there's a sense of pride or ownership that each man of the quartet doesn't want to let the others down. So when we're on stage performing, yeah, you don't want your voice to crack or I don't want to peter out on that note or whatever it might be. Um, and so I think there's, and the thing is you have to remember too, we met each other you know, at a young age and, right. and we we're, it was always peer pressure. And I think even though now that we're older, significantly more comfortable in all of our skin, I think there's still a little bit of that you know, I don't want to go out there and be the one that doesn't deliver, yes. you know, tonight with the, with the quartet, but it's great though, because the quartet went from a, a bunch of young dudes, you know, trying to find our way in this contest thing. And now, I mean, I can safely say we are four of the greatest friends ever. We were in, in all each other's weddings, been there for birds of all the kids. I mean, and it's, uh, it's been an amazing journey and maybe to circle back to a question you asked earlier, asked earlier about, do we rehearse right now? You know, because remember early on, no kids, no job. We're in college. We're just singing all day. And now yeah. you fast forward. Everybody's got careers. We've got eight or 
nine kids between all of us. I guess we had 10 kids. I think there's 10 <laughs> kids now between all of us, jobs, traveling, and all that. So it's been significantly more difficult for us to get together. The pandemic obviously rocked everything because they said singing is one of the more dangerous, you know, activities you could participate in with particles and yeah, because you're throwing your stuff. voice oh, so yeah. big, yeah, yeah. So that 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 really put a halt on everything, but it's slowly starting to 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 come back. So we're do you guys still compete as a quartet, or is it now you're you're performing for people for audiences for pleasure? Yeah. So once you win as a quartet. Your name is retired. You can no longer compete again in the same foursome once you win. So it's kind of cool, kind of stinks, I guess. Um, but the, I, I say well, one of the differentiators of with our quartet, which I'm very proud and I say blessed with, is a lot of quartets will win the international contest. They'll get all the shows for the next year or two until the next champ comes along. And they just kind of like fizzle out. And I think we were one of the rare ones for whatever reason, um, that we've had a tremendous career from a longevity standpoint. You figure we won the international men's contest in 2006 and have still are as busy as we possibly want to be and get offers to travel all over the world still. And so now we have to be a little bit more selective of picking and choosing since we've got kids and careers and all that. But um, that's one thing that I think has been a big differentiator for us. I don't know why that's happened. I don't know if it's because I say now we are best friends first before quartet, where mm -hmm. early on maybe we were quartet. But um, through that, the fostering of those relationships, I think we just enjoy being together now. And I think the quartet is almost an excuse now to get together. Oh, so you know? good. So and you, you talked about music, specifically the acapella music and the group, the ambassadors of harmony being responsible in part for your relationship with your wife and your <laughs> yeah. job. Tie, tie that together. Sure. For me. So 16 years old, quit hockey, start singing acapella music. I'm in this course, start moving my way up the, uh, the, the ladder, as far as the hierarchy, become a section leader, kind of a co-director. And some gentleman comes strolling off the street, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll circle back and start with this. Our quartet, Vocal Spectrum, just won in 2006. Okay, I'm going to really date myself here, and you'll think this is funny. In 2006. <laughs> and so we're getting all these show offers from people all over the world, all over. And um, there was a chorus down in Texas, a female chorus, a women's ensemble, same thing like the Ambassadors, but in the women's version. They're part of an organization called Sweet Adelines International. They're a 130-voice championship women's chorus. They're awesome. And they ask us to be on their show. And I'm like, bam, that's great. They got great audience, great chorus. Um, and through the grapevine, uh, I see on MySpace, okay, this oh, is MySpace. dating myself We're moving now, back a minute. And going back a hot minute on MySpace, I see this really cute gal within the front row of the Rich Tones. And I'm like, holy cow, who's that? And so I'm kind of stalking on MySpace, <laughs> and I finally throw a line to this gal. I'm like, oh, hey, you know, um, I think our quartet's doing your show. You know, I, I'm just curious, you know, is there any good restaurants around? It was just a total Yeah, joke. you're throwing it oh, out there. Oh, gosh, you know, I was making up anything to, to touch base with this gal. And uh, sure enough, we start striking up conversations. So we were doing their show, and I don't know, maybe six or eight months from my conversation. And, any good restaurants? And oh, yeah, I know this one. And we start making small talk, and sure enough, that is now my future wife, Lexi, that I've now have married. We've got four kids. Wow. All of that because of, I say, this quartet and getting on their show, striking, striking up conversation. And now here we are, 10, 11 years, four kids And do kids you guys later. sing together um, since she obviously has some good pipes also yeah. and can sing? Do you guys, is that part of your family thing? Do you sing with the kids, Christmas carols, that yeah, whole deal? Yeah, music is a huge part of, I say, our family community. And my okay. wife is an amazing singer. She sang in a quartet as well. Well, on the Sweet Adeline, again, the female organization, they ended up getting second place in the world. Uh, and then they, unfortunately, the quartet disbanded because the babies and all that sort of stuff. But yes. they were great. They were great. So it is definitely part of our uh, our culture in our household. All of our kids, they sing. Do they sing? They, oh, yeah. They, yeah, got, good, they yeah. got mom and dad's voices? Yeah. The, a couple of them have perfect pitch, but I can just tell them, you know, hey, sing this note, and they can just sing it as out of the air. So it's pretty wild. Can so, you... Can you um, appreciate different types? I mean, kind of a dumb question, but can you appreciate different types of music or are you really tuned in to the acapella stuff? Like, is there something that you say, man, this, I get this from this type of music? Because music, what do they say, is the universal language, mm -hmm. right? Love and music, so the universal true, language. It is and, so true. Because you, you could take, without knowing, you've traveled the world, and I was thinking about this, 
there might be plenty of people that don't understand a word that's coming out of your mouths when you guys are up there singing yeah. as a quartet or as a group, but I promise you they get the message. Yeah. You know There's, what I mean? I, you know, you hit the nail on the head and you know, we talk about music being the, the universal language. Obviously we've had the good fortune of traveling all around and seeing all kinds of different ensembles from orchestras to, you know, African, you know, stomping groups and all these, and they all have their own different, unique, you know, um, elements that they bring. And, and I think that's what is fantastic about music is that, you know, it, regardless of, it, it just takes away all barriers. Do you know what I mean? Of everything from gender, race, ethnicity, it doesn't matter. And that's, it's, it's pretty amazing. But I mean, you know, to talk about the power or the influence of music is where, is why I love the pursuit of excellence in music because knowing the impact that it can have on people. And I say that, that throughout our career, there have been amazing stories that people have shared with us about how our music, specifically in the quartet and the ambassadors for that matter, has impacted their lives. Can you share one? One that I really mean, moved you guys? Boy, there's a, I mean, there's a, yeah, there's a bunch of them for sure. And, you know, people sending emails and, you know, my son was battling this or that. But I mean, I remember one and it was, you know, it was a show I'm in the middle, I say in the middle of nowhere, it was the middle of I Ames, Iowa. Mm -hmm. You know, we're doing some show there. I don't, you know, and, and it's in some stadium or where theater and, and, um, and I'll never forget it. So afterwards, we typically set up a table and we're selling CDs. This is back when CDs were, you know, the thing. And we're signing autographs. And I will never forget it. I will never forget it. This gentleman came up to me and he had his CD with him. And it was worn, meaning he had it for a while. I'm going to get misty out here talking about it. He came up and he said, would you guys sign this? And I said, yeah, of course, he says, you don't know. But this CD helped me get through my chemotherapy treatments. Oh, man. So he would listen to that for the joy and the yeah. just to help him heal. Yeah. Oh, Johnny, that's incredible. Yeah. And it's just like, and the thing is, you know, here we are, we're selling CDs and it's like, holy geez, it just takes you back to like this musical art form and what we work so hard on, like has that sort of impact on somebody. You know what? I got to share this with you. So um, this will go out in a few weeks after we record it, right? Mm -hmm. It was when this will go out. And just last weekend, there was a television show on that paired, um, Lady Gaga yeah. with um, Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Tony Bennett turned 95 years old. Incredible. And that dude, if you didn't see him, if you just had the sound down or you were doing something else, his voice was not far off from Incredible. whatever you've heard him in the music. And to see, like you say, bringing people together, yeah. I can't imagine two people that wouldn't go together quicker yeah. than Tony Bennett and, and Lady, Lady Gaga. Gaga. Yeah. But you could see the love there 100%. for the music and yeah. for the commitment of of changing lives and making a, a difference, you know. And so to hear what you say, it, that just I couldn't get over watch. I couldn't quit watching it because of the <laughs> tale of how he was. And yeah. I can feel it with you that music does that to you. What is the some of the biggest lessons that um, life lessons that music has taught you? That when looking that we can, I, I, I'll make sure I phrase this right, that in these communities of the quartet and or the chorus or an organization, wherever it might be, you know, we, I think the impact that we have together collectively is greater than just the one, if that makes sense. Okay. I mean, I personally, Johnny Maroney, could never have the impact or the reach that I do thanks to these platforms, if that makes sense. Yes. And so being a part of the ambassadors and the impact that, you know, because here's the way I look at it. If you just took a random member from the ambassadors of Harmony, he may not have the impact or reach or get up on stage and sing a solo that's going to bring people to tears the way that this mass collection of humanity coming together and impacting lives. And so I love the fact that the the at least the style of music because again i love solo singers or a fantastic violinist or pianist like those definitely have their place a hundred percent and mm -hmm. those can be equally as impactful but i love the community aspect of what i say what we do yes. and that's maybe just because the way that i'm wired but you know it's uh it's the like i said it's the, it's the hard work when improvement is evident but we get to collectively feel that and 
I love that aspect of it. And it was, you know, circling back to the gentleman's statement of when he said, hey, this CD helps me get through my chemo treatments. It just makes you want to work that much harder. Oh, you know what I mean? And yes. be that more, much, you know, better for the next person that may need. Because the thing is, we never know. Even That's in this right. podcast, we have no idea who's listening to this, who this could resonate or impact. That's or even so your good. guys' world, like in the legal space, like how your work, hard work, right, can impact others. That, well, I'll tell it's you, reach. watching one of the videos that I watched, of the several that I watched, you were co-directing the, the large group. And so as the ambassadors finished, mm-hmm. the camera panned out from looking from back of the audience straight onto the stage. It was a side view and it showed you whip around and you know the, the time finishes, everyone, the, the whole group is standing and you take a bow, you share you know, credit with the audience, but it's from the side. And you could see the size of the theater and my oh, this, goodness, dude, this, it was enormous. Thousands. And all, I could, all I wanted to feel, what does that feel like when those people are standing and cheering and you're receiving that love that you gave, like what is that like? Oh, it's pretty, it's an adrenaline rush for sure. Yeah, we've had the good fortune of singing in front of thousands and thousands of people. We sang on the, for whatever reason, they were celebrating, I think it was the 75th anniversary of the Chinese national anthem, okay? (laughs) And they flew us, this quartet from the Midwest to come over and sing the Chinese national anthem at this huge outdoor event. And it was cast all over the Chinese national television. I think they said there was 100, 150 million people that watched this. Come on. of, of, Of these these American boys singing the Chinese national anthem on national TV over there. So it, we've had these crazy opportunities and yeah, it, it is a, it is an adrenaline, it is an adrenaline rush. Um, and it, you know, it's, I want to say it's, I don't want to sound like egotistic, like, man, look at what we did. It's like, what, what reach do we have? How do we impact yes. people? How do we influence other people to sing? You know, it's one of our real big goals as well. How do we, how do we preserve music? Cause I mean, the way I look at it, if, if everybody in the world sang more, it would be a better world. So true. And I'll say that again. If everybody in the world sang more, it would be a better world. And you know, not to go off on my own soapbox here, but like you watch things like the American Idol. Yeah. And it's great. You know, it got I was going to ask talent. what you thought about that. The Voice, the American Idol. I was wondering what your thoughts were on it's, that. I, I, I love the idea of it. The thing I don't like about it is how it's become a mockery of those that can't sing. And I think it discourages, mm. you know, they got the guy they bring in there and, oh, Simon, oh, that was just awful. And I think there's a hint subconsciously of people like, oh, I can't sing or I'm not that good. And everybody can sing. Yeah. Everybody can sing. Even if you don't think you're good or not or right or wrong. That, so I still go back to my, I say my philosophy is that regardless if you're good or bad, if everybody just sang more, the world would be a better place. There's no doubt about it. 100%. So good. Because, you know, we, and it's interesting, the types of messages that come through music, whether you're, it's your music of choice, right? No matter what it is, there is a message coming through. And typically that message is something from the artist's or the writer's heart on what they might be feeling about their own life or about the, the world they live in or the political or economic climate. And so some of those messages are completely uplifting. Mm-hmm. Some are horrifying because of their experiences, but it's a way to get that out. And like you say, if people, if we could understand when you're singing a song intentionally that makes you feel good you can't help but feel good if you're just singing along to the radio or or whatever it is there's just a connection to music and and i hear you saying that is that 100%. you probably get to feel that every day yeah. right well i mean you think think i mean even for yourself or any listener out there think of an emotional association you have with a song and everybody can yes whether it be even if it's a breakup or that was our wedding song or that's hey that's my girlfriend's song that's our song that was a song that we played at such and such a funeral like whatever it is there's i i, I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody that doesn't have an association of emotion with some sort of musical moment or so vice true. versa you know I, mean, I can think of you know and think of the songs that you play that you used to listen to me when you're younger and just the flood of memories you get when Oh yeah, that was the one that we listened to driving to X Y Z. Like, there's such an such a, an attachment and correlation between music and emotion. That's why I say, if more people just sang and were more plugged into music, we'd be we'd be much better off than just sitting around thumbing through social media. Oh, Johnny, and on that note, man, I'm <laughs> telling you, 
that's a that's a mic drop moment. Um, I'm going to recommend to everyone who's listened to the show today, as soon as we're done, process it, but go listen to some music. Go find something that makes your heart uplifted and put that in your ears and sing along with it or just close your eyes and let it take you away. This has been fascinating for me. I can't believe 45 minutes went by like, like 45 <laughs> seconds. Um, for people that want to listen, see you guys, whether the quartet or the ambassadors, um, how can they find more? You talked about the YouTube stuff. I know you guys sell some some music mm -hmm. with whether it be I don't know how they do it yeah, now. It's all streaming. It's all streaming. Downloaded. Yeah, yeah, streaming. So um, tell people how they can connect yeah, so with I, you. I made reference to it earlier. So the big chorus is called the Ambassadors of Harmony. So you can just Google YouTube, whatever it might be. Google, uh, yeah, Ambassadors of Harmony, and then the quartet uh, is called Vocal Spectrum, just like a light spectrum, but Vocal Spectrum. Again, you could. YouTube, you can find us on Facebook, all that. So, um, but yeah, you'll you'll end up going down rabbit holes of a whole bunch of songs and performances over the years, which all of them are just really just candid photos from people popping out their iPhone or us on a show. So nothing that is, I would say, overly professionally produced. Since you know, we're can just they still down, download music, stream music from you? Yeah, yeah, you can find us on any streaming platform. On uh, um, I'd say Apple Music is probably our, our predominant one, so we're on there. We're on Spotify. So yeah, you can find us anywhere outstanding yeah, well listen wild. you have absolutely made my day today <laughs> and i know you guys came in you flew all the way in from st louis to come yeah. hang out with us and you know we're doing work today and you took a break to talk about your passion and something i love which is music so man i can't thank you enough. well i appreciate it. you know it's rare for me to come and talk about music stuff since we're mostly talking business and uh but i appreciate it. i think music is really really important so hopefully the, the the listenership out there will take it to heart and let's just do some more singing i know they will and by the way speaking of that if you've enjoyed this please send it to someone who you know who loves music or um, who's never tried acapella or listened to it, send it to them. Like all the shows, we appreciate you. If you wanna to listen to something else, we try to go so diverse and so wide in our topics here. It's not all about law. In fact, it's hardly ever about law. It's about making a difference. So share it. You can get the podcast subscribed from all kinds of places, all your typical haunts. So do that. And until next time, be safe and be well.